Thank you very much and uh, good afternoon everyone. I'm extremely glad to be uh, here among you, at least virtually. I hope that we will be able in the coming months to resume uh, conferences uh, in person. I would like to thank very much Eric and Felix Boat for hosting Eurek this afternoon and I'm extremely glad to uh, make a presentation on what is happening in Brussels with a particular focus on the revision of the waste shipment regulation, which is uh, a key element or a key piece of legislation uh, that recyclers throughout Europe have to deal with on a daily basis. So I'm just going to um, go through for the next 10 minutes, uh, both uh, for instance, uh, re regarding the um, the, the regulatory or the policy framework in which we are operating right now and dive a bit more uh, into uh, basically the revision itself and I will be more than happy to take uh, questions uh, at the end of my presentation. I would like eventually if, Eri, if Felix Bot wants to say anything as an introduction feel free obviously to interrupt me anytime um, otherwise I will uh, basically uh, continue. It's completely all right. Thank you, Emmanuel. Just uh, take your time, have fun. Thank you so much for being here. We, uh, it's lovely to have you again and to hear everything you can tell us about. Have fun. Okay, super. So indeed, my name is, is Emmanuel Katrakis. I'm the Secretary General of FURIC, which is the European Recycling Industries Confederation. I'm now trying to move my slide. I hope it's going to work. Um, we are based in Brussels. Um, we represent uh, recycling companies uh, throughout Europe, more or less more than 5.5 thousand uh, companies, but more or less 6 thousand companies, from small and medium sized companies to the largest operators, um, local jobs which cannot be outsourced uh, outside Europe, um, million tons of waste recycled per year, and uh, for an average annual turnover of about uh, 95 billion euros per year. Uh, we cover different streams, so we represent the sector at large, but we also cover very uh, specific streams, metals, plastics, paper, textiles, tires, and of fly vehicles, e-waste and batteries, um, and we have dedicated branches or, or committees that are looking after all those streams. Um, and uh, we are also very much working in close, because that's basically how we work, uh, collaboration with uh, European and international uh, bodies. So we are uh, basically a member or experts in very different types of platforms, from sustainable finance to standardization bodies, which are going and which are having and we have an increasing importance for our industries um, in the coming years. Also working on eco-design to try to bridge uh, basically design stage with the end of life phase and, and try or strive to make sure that products that are placed on the market today are designed not only to suit consumers' needs, but also make sure that they are easier to recycle when they reach end of life stage. And we obviously work um, at different international level the UN uh, Basel and Stockholm Convention, and especially the Basel Convention, which is of particular interest when it comes to uh, waste shipments. Um, the, the circular economy is, uh, I would say today, an extremely trendy expression. Um, if we are a bit less uh, casual, I would say it's a must. We've said that all the time for years, and the reality on the ground is that there is still a huge amount of work to do to move away from linear value chains and go to circular value chains. I just quote here um, the uh, circularity gap report that is basically um, every year published and where you can see that according to the latest edition, only 8.6% of the global economy is circular. So there is clearly some uh, basically, uh, uh, let's put it like that, um, room for improvement. Now, when we look at that European level, I found this uh, graph extremely interesting and I think it's also relevant for today's topic. What we see is that um, the circular material use rates, so basically the amount of materials, raw materials from recycling that has used 
uh, by Europe's industries is only roughly 12%. So it means that we um, are better than performing slightly better than the global picture, but we are not yet to a point where uh, our economy is fully circular to say the least. So here you see a flow chart that dates back basically from um, 2017, but when we look at Eurostat data for uh, 20, uh, 2019, the, the level of improvement is rather marginal, is better than nothing, but we still have a long way to go uh, before basically increasing the rate or the amount of recycled materials used back into production processes. Now, even before, because I think it's extremely important, before moving into the topic linked to the waste shipment regulation, um, I, I think it's really also important to keep in mind that with or without the COVID crisis, and even I think even more with the COVID crisis, the ambition of the European Commission today to make of a green transition uh, a kind of a strategic priority is uh, something that is extremely important. And that also explains the fact that the legislation, the, legis the legislative changes that we are going to witness in the coming weeks or months will be extremely important for our industry, but also for many other industries. So I just take here the expression that was taken by the president of the commission uh, herself about the fact that the Green Deal is Europe's moment on, Europe's, is Europe's man on the moon moment, sorry for uh, for that, just to show that the, f the level of ambition is extremely high. Now, if we look again from a more um, holistic perspective, which is a kind of widely used expression here, but let's look at, at it from a broader perspective. When we look at the Green Deal today, we see that circular economy, climate neutrality are actually two main pillars um, of, of that strategy, but that has a much broader impact because sustainable finance, for instance, is also part of the equation. And this is why so much work is being done right now on setting criteria for activities that are supporting that transition. Having said that, and I will really get back to the topic, which is where shipment regulation, uh, that basically uh, has been translated to the new circular economy action plan, which I had the chance to talk a bit more, I think, during my last intervention. And just to uh, basically close the loop, make the point with uh, basically one of the key priorities within that new circular economy action plan, and one of which is of high importance for today's presentation, which is basically to simplify waste shipments procedure for intra-EU trade. This is more or less in line with, or very much in line with what Rick has been calling for. But if you look at the strategy itself, it's also written black and white, that there is an attempt to make export of waste outside Europe uh, basically more complex. And this will obviously have an impact on the recycling industry for very good reasons. On one hand, I think there are a few matters on which we have been very supportive to try to make sure that unprocessed, for instance, e-waste or ELVs or tires are not being exported to um, places lacking any infrastructure for proper treatment. But this will also have some potentially negative impacts for the reasons I'm going to explain in a few uh, minutes. Let me go to um, my next slide. I know that right now we are all stuck at the office. So I'm not trying basically to, to show a wave to, to make you believe that time has come to go for holidays. We still have to respect the rules right now. But on the other hand, I also want to show uh, basically the fact that uh, all the new circular economy action plan and uh, Green Deal obviously is going and is bringing uh, drastic changes in terms of regulation that is going to be applicable to the waste management and recycling industry and at the same hand, on the same hand to downstream users and the entire European industry. Now, if we look at the situation today, frankly speaking, I think the waste shipment regulation must be ambitious because when uh, working on a daily basis with our members, what we see is that we do not have any well-functioning new market for secondary raw materials. That has to do with, I would say, two or three main things. First, the fact that the harmonization of the procedure itself 
is, is not done. There is far too much uh, room for various interpretations when we are shipping waste for further recovery or secondary raw materials meeting quality standards but that are still being considered or classified as a waste, unfortunately, from one EU member state to another. There is also no harmonized end of waste criteria. So here I took the example of paper and the fact that a single load of a quality grade recovered paper meeting EN643 standard might change classification between two uh, when, when it's being shipped from two neighboring countries. And frankly speaking, I think that this really has to be sorted out um, through both the revision of the waste shipment regulation and at the same time making progress on end of waste criteria at European level for a number of streams that are meeting quality standards uh, to make sure that we are supporting uh, uh, basically uh, free movement of secondary raw materials within the internal market. I think it's absolutely essential and I cannot stress that again because we have been waiting a bit too long and we actually are placing a lot of expectations in what the European Commission is going to propose in the coming weeks and months. Um, I think the other reason, be it for Annex 7 procedures or uh, basically notification procedures is the fact that especially for notification procedure they remain far too complex and we are still mostly dealing with paper-based uh, procedures in a number of member state countries of member states across Europe and would very strongly benefit from moving away from paper-based procedures to go towards electronic procedures which would be easier both for competent authorities and operators both to fulfill, to fill in, to fulfill and to control uh, throughout um, normal uh, waste shipments happening uh, cross-border uh, within uh, Europe. Now, when we look at uh, basically uh, trade of secondary raw materials and waste outside Europe, um, they remain and they are absolutely essential for two reasons. Uh, first, because, or the main one actually, is the fact that uh, for a number of streams, the amount of waste that are being recycled back into secondary raw materials um, in Europe exceeds the demand. So it's absolutely essential to uh, basically safeguard access to international markets for uh, basically secondary raw materials that are meeting quality uh, specifications. Uh, otherwise, our industry will be facing uh, extremely important problems. Um, and just here, I took a kind of flow chart showing, especially for metal scrap, where the arisings are taking place, so the, the, the rising in terms of basically uh, collection and, and recycling and where the demand is. Um, and you see that basically you have pluses and minuses uh, throughout Europe. And it's, it's actually extremely important to make sure that this access to international market is, is safeguarded. But on the other hand, uh, I think we need to make sure in Europe that we are incentivizing the use of raw materials from recycling through recycled content targets or incentives to support more circular value chains and actually increase the share of raw materials that are being used or recycled raw materials that are being used back into production processes. And at the same, on the same hand, make sure that we have a better enforcement against illegal shipments, which I also convinced that moving towards electronic procedures will make things a bit simpler, both for the operators to comply with, but also for the authorities uh, basically to be able to make faster checks and more effective checks when it comes to unprocessed e-waste or unprocessed ELVs or unprocessed tires, uh, just to quote a few, that are being exported to places lacking any proper infrastructure for, uh, uh, for, for treatment. Now, um, I know I, I try also to make sure that uh, basically I'm, I'm keeping uh, the time uh, tight so that there is sufficient time for Q&A, what do we have to expect? We have to expect, normally speaking, the Commission to propose, to make a proposal on um, uh, basically um, a revised waste shipment regulation by June 2021. I cannot say that the deadline is going to be met, but so far that's the one that has been announced. Um, and then 
that procedure is going to follow the normal, I would say, uh, or legislative procedure in Brussels, whereby the Parliament and the Member States at the Council will amend the text, and we obviously, as an association, will uh, continue to make our position loud and clear. Um, and um, whether it's going, this revision will take one, two, or one year, six months, one year, or two years. I think no one knows. That will depend on the pace of the legislative procedure itself. Now, what we as an association um, are looking at today, we look, as I say, to really simplify intra-EU shipments for recovery purposes. So we very much, we have been very adamant in calling the Commission to move for electronic procedures, fast-track procedures among pre-consented facilities, harmonized interpretation across the EU, and also more proportionate financial guarantees for notifications. Uh, take on board the global dimension of secondary raw materials market. I think it's essential because we expect the Commission to uh, come up with stricter rules for so-called broadly equivalent conditions so that basically waste exported outside Europe uh, shall be exported to places that or treatment facilities that are meeting broadly equivalent conditions. On one hand, we understand it makes sense for uh, basically unprocessed waste. On the other hand, as I said, it would be absolutely essential to ensure that uh, secondary raw materials that are meeting uh, basically uh, quality specifications, industry specification, are not hampered uh, in terms of free and fair and sustainable access to um, international markets because for a number of streams the European market itself is not sufficiently developed and in any commodity market free and fair trade is essential to balance supply and demand and stay competitive. On the other hand we also and that's very much linked to what I've been saying before, strengthen the enforcement of the waste shipment regulation to basically have more harmonized rule across uh, member states uh, within Europe and also move towards electronic procedures which, which we are convinced will also support uh, better enforcement uh, and make things much easier both for operators and for the authorities to carry out shipments within the internal market and at the same time be uh, much better when it comes to enforcement. I think especially when it comes to the international dimension, um, not only in terms of leveling the playing field with primary raw materials, but also in terms of making sure that we are not uh, only living and having a circular economy at European level, we'll have to do a bit more work at continue the work at Basel level and at OECD level to enhance environmental sound management of waste globally. And here I put plastics or e-waste as examples, but this is obviously much broader than only those uh, two streams. And I want to stop here. I hope I was not too long and take any questions that you may have um, and hope that uh, basically uh, that intervention shed a bit of life on what is happening, a light on what is happening right now um, in Brussels. Thank you. Emmanuel, thank you so much for your time already. I don't want to stretch, uh, stretch it too long, but we've got a few questions coming in, so I would love for you to answer them pretty quickly. The first is from Lydia. She asked, can we expect simplification of plastic waste shipment within the EU and in what time frame would you say will that happen? You know, I wish, uh, Lydia, that we would have a crystal ball because I think you, you very much um, um, uh, uh, basically um, refer to, to that uh, guidance that uh, the Commission came with and, and the proposed 2%. Um, we, as as you speak, and with other associations, stress the fact that we obviously want to make sure that basically there are a certain amount of thresholds for, for those uh, um, plastic waste shipments, but that the, the, the proposed basically uh, a threshold was really throwing the baby with the bathwater, not putting any clarity, not supporting circularity within plastics. And right now what we see is that the proposal itself is in a standstill mode and that there is a potentiality or a chance that the revision of the waste shipment regulation itself will try to address the problem that arise with that guidance that so far is, is only a draft uh, stage. So unfortunately, the only thing I can say without going far too much into details, 
is that we work hard on it. We, together with other organizations, we try basically not only to explain, but to come up to uh, more, I would say, practical solution than, you know, one size fits all 2% that makes no real sense. If I got your, correct, your uh, point right, we have also made a lot of outreach with NGOs to explain that the point is that we don't try to water down the uh, obligation that came with the buzzer, but we want to protect the, the internal market and make sure that plastics that is collected, that is sorting, will have the ability to be shipped to another country within the EU for proper treatment. But I must say, given the fact that the opinions were extremely divergent once the proposal was made, no consensus or compromise has been reached. And I know on the ground this is extremely burdensome, demanding huge legal uncertainty for the operators. And we are the first one, to be frank, to, to make the case and to, to voice the concerns that you are having on the ground. And you feel free to send me an email separately and I can even with my team provide more information on what is happening and what is likely to happen. Emmanuel, thank you so much for that answer. And uh, when I'm looking at the time, uh, you told me you are a little bit short on it. No, it's so... fine. We can take five more minutes for more questions. Oh, yeah. All right, perfect, perfect. So maybe um, here came in another question in regarding the the exact, uh, even what how do you say it, the exact future is a little bit uh, overwhelming. But um, what are maybe the opportunities there that will come up with that? You were talking a lot about the markets, of, uh, of course, regulating themselves. Before your presentation, we had another presentation which were where there was some talk about uh, plastic recycling in Africa, and you have huge price differences uh, if you look at recycled plastics in Africa. If you look at them right here, how would you say what what are things that will happen in the future if we can open this market up? Well, I, can, I don't want here to make the link between the, the, indeed the situation in Africa where the challenges are, are different, but which also can really uh, bring some opportunities uh, for, for Africa first and, and for, for us as European as well to strive together towards a more sustainable future, because this is really the end game at the end of the day. But at least from a European perspective, what I see is the fact that um, the amount of regulation I think is not going to decrease because um, with with basically that kind of green transition that has become the alpha and the omega, if I may say, of of policymakers, um, the, the 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 legislative changes are going to bring actually very far-reaching uh, changes. But on the other hand, what we see is that there is a strong push to use more raw materials from recycling into production processes, and um, basically the fact that everybody start to understand, I'm not saying that we are always there, that circular value chains require more cooperation between us recyclers and the companies we represent and downstream users. And I also see and know that the Commission understands the need to go beyond recycling targets, quantitative targets that are what they are, and also move towards more incentives or even targets to use uh, basically recycled materials back into uh, plastics or all the materials. And we saw, for instance, for PET, that recycled content obligations set within the single-use plastics directive have had positive effect on the market during basically uh, the first lockdown during the first semester of 2020, where with plummeting oil prices, the fact that they were binding targets for recycled content actually enable to decorrelate the prices for recycled PET from uh, the market prices for virgin polymers and not endanger investment that the recycling industry has been doing. Unfortunately, those obligations today are far too now. I'm just speaking of one stream, recycled PET uh, for packaging, but I think there is a, a more general understanding that if we want to go towards more circular economy and move away from only 2%, we need basically to go the extra mile and set targets or put incentives to use more raw materials from recycling back into production facilities and actually work hand in hand with, uh, with the entire value chains. The other thing I also see 
room for improvement in terms of design, designed for reuse and recycling. Um, we expect uh, an initiative from the Commission in the coming uh, uh, basically uh, weeks. Um, but on the same hand, I must say that we need um, also more engagement from um, the recycling community uh, through URIC on basically making sure that we come up with very practical proposal when it comes to better design for all products that we are basically basic placed on the market today and which are posing a problem when they reach end of life. So again, feel free to get back to us um, and bring that uh, to our attention directly. You have our website and, and email because that's something that is very valuable. Um, and I would also stop here. Uh, the waste shipment regulation has a, an impact on trade, but I also think that the impact on trade is going to come through other, uh, basically, uh, proposal with a much wider impact, not only on us, actually not on us, but on our downstream users. We know that the Commission wants to come up with plans for a carbon border adjustment mechanism, for instance. So far, we don't have much indication on how it's going to fly, but this will also certainly have an impact on trade as soon as you start to try to price carbon at the border one way or the other. And I would stop here. <laughs> Thank you so much, Emmanuel. Uh, Thank you for only sharing for the questions knowledge. there are, obviously. <laughs> it's perfect. No, uh, it's that, that has been all. Thank you so much. For anybody else uh, who got any questions, who wants to get in contact, please do. Uh, you've got the website, you've got the email. And yeah, Emmanuel, what it was so lovely having you once again please if are there any last words you would love to share with the audience no i, I would like again to thank eric for organizing those virtual conference it's as i always say very important to uh especially when we work in brussels on only policy regulatory developments talking all the time to our members to have those virtual way to interface with a much broader audience and i would like to thank you for all the work you've been doing in setting up that program today and i hope to uh, continue supporting what you are doing in in the weeks months and years to come so thank you very much thank you and thank you to to all of you who participated today and i would love to see you again tomorrow for our last day of erec conferences and yes have a nice evening see you soon bye bye thank you <laughs>